Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day, Lil. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. I'm your host for Yoga Birth Babies, and today we're talking twins, everything twins, twins birth, twins pregnancy, raising twins, the whole world of twins. And I have Natalie Diaz talking to us about that. Natalie is the Pied Piper of twin families around the globe, founding Twinversity, the world's leading support network for multiple birth families. Natalie is also a certified lactation counselor and a child passenger safety technician. She's also the author of the global bestseller, What to Do When You're Having Two. So I'm really excited to talk to Natalie. And Natalie at Twinversity is offering a special discount code for the Breastfeeding Twins class and a free online breastfeeding class when folks sign up for the New York, Chicago, or Houston classes. So super exciting to get a discount. You can find that discount code in our show notes. So check those out. Also, what else is coming up? We are heading in a couple weeks. Caprice and I are heading to Charlotte, North Carolina for teacher training. I can't believe we're getting our second one starting up and going. And there's a few spots left for Washington, D.C. for January and February. Sign up for the spring for New York City. We're already having people register for that's March and April. Richmond, Virginia for May, April and May. Yeah, April and May. So good things coming. And then also just a request, if you are listening to this on your Apple podcast, on your iPhone, go ahead and scroll down, 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 down to our ratings and review. And please leave a rating and review for Yoga Birth Babies. And of course, really anywhere that you're listening to this. So thank you. Thank you. All right. I think that's it. Let's take a super quick break. And when we come back, enjoy my conversation with Natalie. Every year for my kid's birthday, my mom makes them a photo album of the pictures I sent her throughout the year. And it's fantastic and really a win-win for everyone because I am particularly horrible about executing and organizing projects like this. Now, even though my mom's the one doing the work of making the album, I still have to get her the pictures. And as a busy working mom, sometimes I find that task overwhelming. But this year, I think things are going to be different because I found a free photo sharing app. It's called Family Album. With Family Album, it has been so easy to share photos. I decide who I want my photos shared with, and every time I upload a new picture, my invited guests get a notification that new memories have been added. No more texting pictures, no more trying to shove as many pictures into one email. It has become so streamlined. Organization's also incredibly easy with Family Album since it sorts the pictures by the month taken and tells me how old my kids are in each picture. So I'm trying to get my mom pictures for the album. I can see, all right, I've got some in November, I've got some in December, I've got some in January. Organization's so much easier. I actually wish I had this app when I was pregnant so I could have watched my pregnancy evolve and seen how my belly grew instead of what I have is just some random pictures and actually not knowing where in my pregnancy I was. My kids also love Family Album because of the one-second movie highlights. Every three months, a short video collage is created using the best photos and video clips I have shared. They love seeing themselves in these movies, and I love seeing how much they've changed in just three months. And Family Album also offers free, unlimited storage. I kid you not when I say I have over 5,000 pictures taking up storage on my phone and computer. By saving them on the Family Album app, I have freed up so much space on my devices, which has been a huge help. And did I mention all these great features and convenient photo sharing opportunities is completely free. 
free family album. You can find it through your favorite app store or search family album on Google. And remember, family album is all one word. So hurry up and go get this free app. Start sharing your memories with the people that you love. It is Ryan here and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18. Plus. Hi, Natalie. How are you today? Oh my God. I'm so good. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for allowing me to grace uh, my presence on your podcast. (laughs) Thanks for spending some time with me today. I am so excited to talk about the wonderful world of twins. Um, My closest friend has twins. I've watched her go through that. And several, a lot of my students have twins and twins run in my family. So I was actually um, a little terrified. (laughs) Twins. In fact, I remember my husband at our like eight week checkup. He said, "He said to our doctor, like, do another sweep around in there just to make sure there's not one hiding. Just gotta be sure. <laughs> just gotta, be just sure. gotta check. Sweep the room. That's it. Make sure you're good. So this is exciting. <laughs> so I guess let's just jump in with let's hear a little bit about you and your journey into parenthood and and twinversity, kind of that whole spiel. Oh my gosh. Well. It began many, many years ago in a very dark time. No, you know, it's it's actually a really fun evolution. I have a very interesting background where I actually went to culinary school and I'm a native New Yorker and my family owns three restaurants. And so you basically were bred to work for the family business. And that is just what you do. And I was totally into it because I am a big fan of eating. <laughs> so to me, it, it was a natural thing. And I had prepared my pretty much my whole life for that. And for whatever reason, um, Mother Nature decided to just be like, mm, no, you're not going to have an easy time at this. So we had a lot of infertility issues. And I started trying to get pregnant, believe it or not, when I was 22. I was already married. I'm one of those weird, weird birds that... Um, when I met my husband, I knew that this was it. He knew that this was it. And even though we were young and dumb, we got married and we actually had a plan and we knew we had very similar philosophies and parenting and life and nothing was working for us. And the doctors were, I'm not going to say, you know, mean, but it was borderline a little cruel to give me false hope because they kept saying, you know, go home and keep trying and you're so young and don't worry and go on vacation and have a drink and relax. Nothing, nothing. Or like, honestly, like Deborah, truthfully, it was, it was horrible. So we had to have five years of documented infertility. And I, if I could like emphasize that word with like italics, because I had to call the doctor every time I got my period so that they could mark it in my file. So for five years, I had to basically call someone to tell them I failed again. And then eventually after the five years, they're like, oh, well, you know, maybe we need to escalate this. So we escalated it. We did stupid IUIs, waste of time for us. Good luck to those of you who have succeeded. And we literally only had one opportunity to do an IVF that was covered by our insurance at the time. And I was like, what else? Like, we got to do it. What are we going to do? We'll give it a go. So we went through the whole process. They ended up um, harvesting 19 eggs, which I was like so happy about. And then you get there on transfer day and they're like, "Mm, Nat, um, only two made it. And you're like, what? And they're like, so we need you to understand the odds are very slim. And so now I'm thinking like, oh my God, I just went through that whole thing. And like another year I wasted and what am I doing? And for whatever reason those two eggs I now pay tuition for (laughs) in New York City high schools. So yes, this is in in Catholic schools they both go to. So yeah, so I, I had totally lost the faith. And then once I found out 
that I was having too, you know, like a lot of moms that have fertility issues, you get like a little shell shocked and you don't want to do anything. I didn't want to move. I didn't want to shake the eggs out. I was afraid to go up steps, like dumb things that I just was very uneducated for. But even though you, you know, logically and medically what could happen, you're so petrified that you're going to undo it. And so I remember going through that time of my life and instead of looking at it with, oh my gosh, remember babe, when I was pregnant and how sweet that was. And this is what I did. It was daily torture, high anxiety, unbelievable sadness and fear and all of that, that went along with it. And I remember going to, um, I found a, a local twins club and I went to the local twins club and I was 14 weeks pregnant And I said, like, I just sat there like a deer in the headlights. And there was a woman that was on the panel and she said, like, this is what I did. And this is how I live. And she didn't have any fertility issues. And she had live in like literal live in help with her. And she lived on Park Avenue. And it was like this very decadent experience and joyful and wonderful. And I sat there and I'm like, am I on the same planet as this person? And I, I didn't go back to another meeting until post delivery, the twenties were seven months. And I realized that for the early part of my um, motherhood experience, I was attempting to live in her shadow. And by me not having a full-time nanny, I was lesser than. By me not having a flawless experience breastfeeding, I wasn't worthy. I also delivered early, so I blamed myself for having those twins early. And there were so many things that were my fault. And I had postpartum depression and like, it was just really bad. And so when the twins were seven months, I went to a meeting and I basically like got on a little soapbox and I'm like, guys, you can't do this anymore. You can't have one voice in a class that says, this is the way it is because I already had postpartum issues, but thanks to you guys, they were magnified. Mm -hmm. And I said, would you just let me do this? Would you let me change the way the club is run? And they said, sure, why not? And from then on, I changed the whole structure of everything. They just, the God bless a volunteer organization that nobody wants to do anything, but they totally handed me the keys and were like, you go get them chicky. And I did. And so instead of having one person on the panel that one person, I had a panel and it was about six people on a panel. And you had the mom who hated breastfeeding, but still did it anyway. You had a single dad who decided to, you know, not be the breadwinner of his family and taking care of his kids full time. You had the mom who had no help. You know, there was a real, so when you left there, although some people were aggravated by being confused and what's the right thing to do, there is no right thing to do. The right thing is what's right for you. Mm -hmm. I like that. Because like I, It's totally Manhattan, right? Because like you're here too and everybody's like, well, this is what you do. I'm like, who, who are they? Who are they to tell you? I think that's so important because sometimes we do go to these events and be like, oh, that must be the, they're the ones speaking. Therefore they must know. And it's great that you're offering um, diversity so that we can all relate. It's really easy to get pigeonholed and then feel like you, like you said, feel badly about yourself. So I'm sure you're not the only one. I know you're not the only one that has had those, the um, IVF ex- uh, anxiety. And even if you haven't had IVF, I've had a lot of people that had miscarriages. Like I, um, I had two miscarriages between my kids. And I remember having in my brain, having to get to a certain point to feel more confident, like past that, that point where things had gone awry. What would you say to that parent that had gone in that path that you did and was feeling that anxiety. I remember having one student, she was afraid to raise her arms over her head because her mother-in-law said it's going to strangle the baby and someone else, like, like you said, like they're afraid the baby's going to fall out. So, and, and logically, I think they, well, I think one of them knew, um, it wasn't really, <laughs> um, physiologically possible. What would you say to that person? If they asked, if you saw that anxiety brewing when it's not, if it literally is when, <laughs> Because in my my world now, I teach classes exclusively for expectant parents, and I often, I know that look. And 
the first thing that I do is I just say, I know it's, and it's, and it's an, I know, and it's not even, I need to describe what it is. She sees, I see it. I have chills thinking about it. And it like, literally it's such a weird industry. And you know, because working with expecting people, but there's this level of trauma that stays with you. And although you get past it, there's still a hint of it. And I think the hint of what that trauma is, is literally what drives me to do what I do every single day, because I'm trying to find her. Mm -hmm. Where is she? She's currently in the eye of the storm. I have to find her. So do I find her through SEO? Do I find her through a podcast? Do I find her through my book? I'm looking for her. She's who I'm looking for. And so when I see her, I, and when you acknowledge her and you're like, you don't have to feel bad for feeling what you feel. I get it. And I promise you, we are going to get through this. And there is no, like, I honestly, I am one of the only parenting sites in this country that has a figurehead that you could call me on my cell phone. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry, we were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over a hundred casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. This podcast is sponsored by Skylight Calendar. Let's be real. Running a household can be exhausting and chaotic. And finding the perfect Mother's Day gift, it's not exactly a no brainer. Until now. The Skylight Calendar is the best way to organize the family and give everyone, especially mom, some peace of mind to enjoy the things that matter most. The Skylight Calendar is a smart, touchscreen calendar that keeps track of and manages the chores, dinner planning, groceries, and to-dos for the whole family. The Skylight Calendar automatically syncs each family member's digital calendars and displays them all together on one color-coded touchscreen. It even doubles as a digital picture frame so you can finally share all those special moments that are just sitting on your phone. As a limited time offer for our listeners, get 15% off your purchase of a Skylight calendar when you go to skylightcal.com slash easy. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-C-A-L dot com slash easy. Get 15% off your Mother's Day purchase now at skylightcal.com slash easy. Like there, this is a very unusual situation. Lucky for me, we're only 3.8% of the population, so it's not, <laughs> it's not too much for me to handle. But I... I need them to know that I'm here. And one of the the great things about Twiniversity and, you know, eventually, obviously, the Manhattan Twins Club grew into um, a global network because there's so much more that you could do when, you know, we do this together as kind of like this twin parenting revolution, which is what we started. But we have really an extraordinary um, mentorship program. So we have a peer-to-peer mentorship program. And we have a full-time staff member doing nothing but matching people up. And so if I can't help her, I have somebody who can. And so in class, it's, it is, and I'm a very touchy person and I don't ask if I could touch people. I know you probably have to, I don't, we just know it's okay. If I open my arms and you walk into them, I'm going to accept that as, you know, permission to embrace you. And sometimes even at the end of class, they'll say like, you get it. And I'm like, yeah, I totally get it. And, you know, I had a very, very, very traumatic delivery, had a very bad first year, had a kid with special needs, truthfully did not go into the restaurant industry with my family because I didn't want to miss therapy with my son. And I changed my whole world so that they were my spotlight. I knew I only had one opportunity to watch what was going to happen. And with everything that I went through, I didn't want to squander it. I was like, I'm there. And so I literally just started writing small articles, like very small articles, like how, like I, I'm an exclusive pumper. There wasn't a lot of information, you know, 14 years ago about exclusive pumping for twins. I did it. I was very fortunate to have the lactation staff at the NICU coach me through that first month. We spent quite a long time in the NICU. And all of those, um, those great experiences and the people that I met and the things I knew, I was like, why are we reinventing the freaking wheel? Like, it's so dumb of us. 
Like I could just write about this. Mm -hmm. And that is literally in a nutshell, how this whole thing came to be. And I'm still doing it every single day. Well, I definitely want to get to some of your ideas about pumping. And I really do appreciate you sharing so much. And I think the community does too. I think many of us that are leaders in a sense of different type of parenting groups, we often come at it from our own place of trauma and then what we've learned, we can pass on. So I would love to jump into, I get a lot of pregnancy, pregnancy twins in class. And one of the questions that I hear a lot, and also I'm a childbirth educator, so I address this a fair amount with them too, but can you talk about some of the major differences that twin parents can expect different than singleton parents? Um, because I want to make sure everyone feels included because a lot of the focus, you said it's 3.5%. So, you know, 96.5% of pregnancies may make the others feel, may make twin parents feel excluded. So Mm -hmm. what would be some of the differences that a twin parent may want to take in consideration? Well, we do, there are some things that are exclusive to our, uh, our twinness, right? So if you have identical twins, we have this issue called twin to twin transfusion syndrome, which is a pretty big deal. It's, um, it's a lower percentage of even people with identical twins, but basically it means that if your twinnies are sharing a placenta, it's unequally distributed. And it is really dangerous to um, both babies because you have the donor and the recipient. So that is um, a big difference. We often get monitored a lot more closely. And, um, you know, for me, it's very tough because like you, being a childbirth educator and a lactation consultant, and like I have a million letters after my name, (laughs) but even with all of that, I still know that technically we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't even be playing in a different field as the rest of the people. But I know that if there is a problem, the problems have a a higher chance of being catastrophic for us and our children. So a lot of people get very disgruntled because they're like, oh my gosh, why am I going to the doctor so much? What's happening? And I'm like, you know what? It's just another opportunity to see your babies with an ultrasound. It's another opportunity to be reassured. But, you know, clearly, I would say probably the biggest difference between a singleton and a multiple birth is that extra baby that is in utero. That's probably a big one. You have a whole separate child in there. Therefore, your uterus grows at a different rate. Therefore, your volume of fluids in your body and your blood volume is different. Um, your th- The whole process of pregnancy is not multiplied. It is exponentially more challenging And you think about diastasis and you think about like all of these issues that a singleton parent might face, we probably will face Mm -hmm. it. And if you don't, then you won. But for us at Twiniversity, you know, in my class, I don't say, here's what's going to happen to you. I say, if this happens to you, here's what we could do about it. Honestly, I know this sounds so weird. We have a higher chance of having hemorrhoids. It's something so simple, but it's not going to come up like, you know, over cocktails, mocktails with your friends. Oh, let's talk about our bathroom issues. Like we, in general. It makes total sense because you have more weight and you probably have more progesterone. Um, Every, all those hormones are increased. And so the pelvic floor can only hold so much. Yeah. But we also have more constipation. Like there's so many more things that could happen because there's no room to eat. You're yeah. filled. Your belly area is filled with a head or feet wherever they are at that time. So there's so many more things going on, even just like joint swelling we talk about. And we see these things in a more advanced fashion. So a typical singleton might not experience things till week 40. We're seeing them at week 32. Mm-hmm. And so at week 32, if you are talking to your coworker who is equal in weeks to you, you're going to have a nervous breakdown. Because you're like, why don't you feel this? And also, she's going to have a nervous breakdown because she's like, why don't I feel that? What's happening? So my first rule, and it's horrible, is I always tell people, if you have a family member or a coworker that is expecting, you should really stop talking to them about your pregnancy. It's just safer for everyone involved because everybody tries to compare and you can't because you know, not only is there a huge difference between a singleton and a multiple birth pregnancy, but every pregnancy is different, especially if it's her fourth pregnancy and your first twin pregnancy. It's, it's apples and oranges. 
Mm-hmm. I totally so, yeah. agree. So how do I have a lot of t- the twins that I've often seen, I'd say a good 90% would like to have a vaginal birth with twins. And I'd say maybe 20% actually do. Um, can you talk about that for those that are having twin or right now, maybe that are carrying twins listening and they're hoping to the reality and what is necessary for both twin A and B for a vaginal birth? Well, we only need A head down. Baby B literally does not even matter in this equation. So if baby A opens the tunnel, baby B may figure it out. So, um, great news. Um, I had my twins vaginally. What? It happens. It does. And I try to remind people that it does. So in class, we talk a lot about creating a birth plan and making sure that the doctor knows what your birth preference is. Because what's hysterical is that there's so many people who want a vaginal delivery that literally never tell their doctor. What? Like, why, why, or why are you waiting for me at week 24 to help you engage in a conversation with your doctor? And then on the flip side, I say, thank goodness that you found me. And now I'm like, okay, here's how we're going to rip off that bandaid and have that conversation. So first thing is, if you want to have a vaginal delivery, you need to talk to your doctor. You also need to talk to your partner about it because at some point you may be a little bit weaker to, um, advocate, advocate for yourself. And you might not push for something that really may be possible. I also recommend that people find if there is, there are so many, um, labor and delivery nurses that are also midwives that I have found, especially in New York and some that are even doulas. Like I find them and I'm like, why didn't anybody tell us? It is so surprising that a lot of people don't ask. And so I always say on the hospital tour, when you're taking your hospital tour to ask if there are any, you know, alternative kind of care people or additional degree people that might be able to help you through. So I try to help them find those people during their hospital tour. Also during the hospital tour, I ask them to, I give you actually a whole list in class, which is pretty funny. But um, I say, when you're taking your hospital tour, ask them what the percentage is of a C-section delivery. Okay. Now with that all said and done, I'm a super advocate for you having a vaginal delivery, but for our families that do have a vaginal delivery, there is 9% of those that end up being a one-in-one delivery. And here's my problem with the one-in-one delivery. If we have one old school, right, no problem, everybody shoots out, nine hours go by. Let's say baby's not in distress, which is totally possible that B is just chilling in his new, you know, single bachelor pad that he has that he's all excited about it. I don't know why he's a boy, but he is, classic boy. And then you have him and he does not want to come out. Now, As a twin parent, what if you're getting close to midnight? So are you going to do something so that they share a birthday? Because that's just going to be really weirdies for people to be like, they're twins. Oh, his birthday's October 31st. His birthday's November 1st. So you have that. Then you, of course, have the issue that if you weren't receiving the proper medications and the proper epidural during that vaginal delivery, and now we got to turn this around and have a quick C-section, they might actually have to use a stronger anesthesia and you might not be awake for the birth of that second baby. So for Twin Diversity families, I really say, let's have a plan for everything. Let's have a plan for vaginal. Let's have a plan for C-section. Let's have a plan for both because knowledge is power. And I know it could be overwhelming, but I'd rather us be realistic about what's going to happen and know where we go. And then if you do end up having a C-section, we have a significant discussion about it's okay to mourn the fact that you didn't have a vaginal delivery. Mm -hmm. It's, It's totally fine. And I need spouses to understand That when somebody says, but what are you upset about? You know, you had healthy babies. No. Yeah, that's fine. I get it. Yes. I'm not saying that I'm not happy that I had healthy babies. I'm just sad that I miss out on an experience that perhaps I have wanted for my entire pregnancy and maybe my entire life. You don't know what somebody's history is. Yeah. We're very clear about that within our teacher training that when we don't know exactly, we don't know, but, and to not invalidate because Mm -hmm. it's very 
demoralizing and invalidating totally. when some we're just holding the space just hold the space let them feel what they're going to feel because if we're constantly pushing those feelings down then that can just worsen that can create postpartum depression postpartum mm-hmm. regret um and then unresolved issues and then that could carry to the next pregnancy should there be another so i wholeheartedly agree with you about that i am the whole idea about the epidural not working I, if, from my knowledge, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it's pretty rare that someone goes to general anesthesia from uh, if they need from having an epidural yes. to needing a section. So but I just, sometimes they may have no epidural. Correct. And but have they, one but, come out. Right. But it's still, they can still do a spinal and epidural pretty quickly. I've, as a dual, I've been with people that have been having um, a physiological birth, no, no pain medication, and then need an epidural. And it can be done quite quickly. I mean, I think the general anesthesia, I don't know the percentage, but it's extremely low. So I just don't want to scare people to think, oh, I'm having twins. Although some of the twins that I've worked with, and you'll know this better, some of their care providers said, if you want to have a vaginal birth, we really want you to have an epidural in place. Um, yes. I've, see, I've heard that. And I have had, on the other side of that, I have had very few that have had twin births without any pain medication. But most of the care providers have pushed for at least the catheter in the back in place should they yes, then need the block. To, yeah, ready to now, go. With that being said, if we're talking local, like New York stuff, it is a little bit different. I tend to go more on a national scale. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you, like in Nebraska, they're not doing the same things we're doing here in Manhattan. True. So honestly, and then whenever I speak, because I don't know who's listening. Right. And so you may say I have a um, Manhattan audience and then somebody's listening that found this and then they're like, why isn't somebody doing that? So I always play to the field. Mm-hmm. This is the way that I look to it. And I do know that while twin, while we do have a ton of twins in our coastal cities, there is a ton Ton oh, of course. Of audience that has no place. So I always like for me, if you're worried about it, you could talk to your specific doctor and say, I need to know what the plan is, which is why I talk about having a birth plan, yes. creating it, starting that conversation with your doctor, because every doctor is different. I remember six years ago, there was still doctors that were like, when you have twins, you go on bed rest at 30 weeks. What? Mm-hmm. Like, like, it's just weird. But then you're like, okay. That's your doctor. You love your doctor. I am not rocking that boat. You yeah. love it? And it's I'm out of our let's scope. Let's do it. Yeah, yes. it's out of our scope. Can you also talk about a lot of twins um, tend to be born earlier? Am I correct about that? Yeah. So 38 weeks is our term. Mm-hmm. Um, very rarely do they want you to go above 38 weeks. And really, there is a lot of medical issues that could happen. And of course, our biggest fear is a uterine rupture. So a lot of times people want to push that envelope. And perhaps if you've had previous great pregnancies and you know, you're know you on your you know your 11th and 12th kid, they may let you do it. By the way, I don't think that doesn't happen. <laughs> Just, uh, so, I can barely handle my two. That's all right? I laugh. I smile and giggle at that because <laughs> oh, we have we have some big big families at Twin University, which is amazing. But um, but yeah, I forgot what our question was. I got so distracted oh, uh, by just the just don't yell at day. me. So yeah, <laughs> so the thing. I'm sorry. I literally was thinking about all the twin families that sometimes there's seven and eight, which I could think is pretty pretty common. But yeah, 38 weeks is our term. There's little hurdles that you have to get over, right? So we want that big like 28 week hurdle and then we want a 30 week hurdle. And then really if we could get past 34, things start looking really good for us. And if you get, you know, past 36, holy Moses, then just strap in because the rest is going to be awesome. As I keep saying, and everybody's like, it wasn't so awesome. Just (laughs) hope for awesome. Just imagine it's going to be awesome. Sit in a tub. You're going to, you'll be okay. Let gravity, let the water help you. But yeah, we do have a higher likelihood and because of that, we do have to have, you know, a little bit of a discussion about the NICU and we talk about, you know, your experience in the NICU and how, even though I was personally there for a month in hindsight, it was a silver lining to my life because those people literally like genuinely literally held my hand and walked me through so many of the processes that I would have been at home alone doing, confused, and worrying if this is the right thing. And they were right there for me. And in my book, one of the acknowledgments that I have is still of my NICU nurse, of which I still speak to, up at Sinai. Like, she is a part of my life. When She's a life-changing part of my life. And a lot of things that I learned, even from there, 
I was like, well, just because you didn't go to the NICU doesn't mean that you shouldn't learn how to do this. So it was like more articles that I wrote. And then, you know, the exclusive pumping, that's kind of where that started because breast milk is deemed medically necessary for a premature baby. So the doctor, instead of just saying, you know, if you can, the doctor's like, you need to pump. And I'm like, all right, well, let's, let's do this. And clearly my love of food, I was like, if I can make some for the babies right now, since I can't make them macaroni, I will, <laughs> I will make them some breast milk. But let's we talk do- about that. Let's talk about the whole breastfeeding schedule and, and two, having <laughs> two babies and pumping. And so those that are thinking like that are have twins, I can't wrap my head around that. How can you give a little bit of support and advice about feeding, breastfeeding two? And pumping with two. I easily can. And if I have to say what the top three questions in Twiniversity are that we get asked on a regular basis, it's help, breastfeeding, and strollers. So those are like the three biggies that we cover on a daily basis. Um, With breastfeeding, it's so funny because as a CLC, I wear a much different hat than a typical twin mom, right? Because I know my personal experience and then I technically know like the medical evidence space Mm -hmm. behind it. And I will tell you, they do not match up. So they just don't. I know biologically what our bodies are supposed to do. Um, The odds of you doing that to the fullest extent, while not impossible, are slimmer than most. So, you know, a a typical singleton is going to alternate babies and breast, you know, baby and breast each time, perhaps whether in one feed and I get the whole demand and supply. I understand that from the back end of things. But as far as the logistics of working through breastfeeding each day, we literally, like no joke, we created, it took us a year to create it, but we have an exclusive online breastfeeding course that's done on demand that's watched globally because we're the only ones that have it. And so there, I found this one lactation consultant that was in Chicago, and she is hands down one of the most extraordinary lactation people that I've ever found in my life. And I actually flew to Chicago to tape this specifically with her. And it's hours and hours of class. And it's, it's taped in a way so that you could watch and get ready before the twenties. And then once the twenties come home and then how to establish a good routine, but routine is the key. And singleton moms will never quite understand this. We can feed on demand. The odds of you feeding on demand are very slim because if you do that, you will never sleep. You will never eat unless there's a baby at your breast. You will never shower unless there's a baby at your breast. You will not sleep. And you really do need to sleep. Like sleep is a critical component of humanity. I think people may forget that, but it is. I don't know if anybody knows. You go Google it. But with twins, it has to be regimented. And I always link back to the NICU because in the NICU, they are not feeding babies on demand there. It would be impossible to feed the volume of babies with the limited staff that they have when the babies were hungry. So while it's still important to check cues and seeing where your baby's cues are, that doesn't mean that you give into it immediately. I know that sounds horrible, but we have to kind of do this as a team. When you deliver a team, that is what you are. You start on day one from the team. You could tandem breastfeed as a team, but where singleton moms win, and I I use that word lovingly, is that you get to know that one baby and you get to know their latch and you get to know their hold and you get to have that one experience with us because you have to feed these babies. You don't get that same kind of um, bonding ritual. Not that you don't bond, but it, it becomes more of a mechanism. And you're like, I have to feed these at first. Once you get the hang of it, and I would say by six weeks and anybody out there that's expecting, just go in with very open eyes and have very realistic expectations. You could do it. I did it. A lot of families do it. But if you don't prepare, you might not be the most successful. So you're better off saying, okay, I need to establish a good supply out of the gate. I need to hand express my colostrum into a spoon in the hospital. Sounds super crazy. Trust me. It works, kids. Just <laughs> trust me on this one. And we have what in Twiniversity, I call them deal breakers. 
And so a lot of things that I get, well, a lot of information that I give to our students and our readers is um, advice and opinions. And there are very few deal breakers and deal breakers are like a must have, like you must go to an infant first aid and CPR class. Like that is a deal breaker, right? And so we have a series of deal breakers. And one of my deal breakers is the colostrum. I totally agree. Can I ask a question about you? Sure. You touched upon something that I was trying to figure out an eloquent way to say, and I still may not. The bonding. You yes. touched upon the idea that singleton moms really do have that time looking down, getting to know that baby, knowing the little gurgle sounds, knowing the latch. Um, my best friend that had twins had this huge boppy for both. And mm-hmm. she did. She would tandem feed. But there is isn't that one-on-one time during that because she was doing two at a time how do you how do you find that bonding with each if you're spending so much time with both you do just like people say how do i find time to spend time with my partner after the babies are born you make the time And one of the best ways to do that is instead of jumping in the water and just trying to swim, breastfeed one at a time to get to learn that baby's habits and their rituals and then introduce them as a pair a little bit later. You could start as a pair to start building up that supply, but understand that it's going to be more of um, like a mechanism ritual than it is going to be like, oh, this very like I'm feeling it. And Deborah, it's so sad, but I have so many families that are like, I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. I'm like, no surprise. You're not feeling it. You're going through the motions and you didn't stop to smell the roses for a second. So let's figure out how we're going to do that. And that's when we involve a partner. That's when we involve, you know, any kind of support team. And it doesn't have to be paid. We talk about all the different types of help that are available. I am a ginormous advocate for postpartum doulas, like, like obscenely. And that is a, a huge but bit I also, to us. I just have to credit you about the not being paid because I think it's so important to recognize that not everyone can afford totally. full-time help. Um, you know, and I can imagine with now with two, if someone's having twins, that's just overwhelming that you may need as much help. So thank you for recognizing that you can get help without or find a way, maybe it's some sort of share or something mm-hmm. that not everyone can afford full-time help. So I just wanted to give you a little applause and pause for that <laughs> because it's it's important. So thank you. So can, I would love to talk about, I was actually surprised when you said the three, stroller surprised me, but what I struggled with, with when I had my second and they weren't twins, but the bedtime and bath routine. Mm-hmm. I remember with one, I'm like, when it was just the three, my husband, my first, and I'm like, we got this, we got this. And then all of a sudden we had a second and I'm like, holy crazy, how am I doing that? Now I'm imagining bed and bath routine with two little tiny babies. Mm-hmm. Share your share your wisdom because I can't even wrap my head around that. <laughs> a bed and bath routine is more like a, a military, you know, action that's in place. So there's there it's definitely very calculated. You need to have everything laid out ahead of time. As much as I could say, this is how you do it, this is a trial and error experience because you may have one baby that loves being in that water and one that's like, wash me, I got things to do. So every baby is really different, but I would ultimately strongly recommend this as a team job. And if people are going to have help there, I always say like my best hours to have somebody in the house are between kind of like four and seven 30. Like if you could only, if you're like, listen, I can't do it, but we could afford a few hours, then five to seven is what I'll take with a local college student that I pay per hour that's specializing in, you know, early childhood speech pathology. Like it's amazing the people that you could find to help. Um, with that, because of this whole slippery baby factor, this is where the the big issue comes in. But the slippery baby factor is a safety issue, and safety, of course, is one of our deal breakers. And I do really worry about making sure that you have this system in place, right? So of course it's, you know, buying soap that could only be used with one hand instead of like a fancy pants bottle where I'm going to, you know, put it in my scrubby and make bubbles. Like none of that. This is total utility, (laughs) total utility. You just pump it into your hand, wash the baby, next baby, let's go. Change the bath water. Don't change the bath water. Believe it or not, up to you. I, we have zero judgment at Twiniversity. 
And for the bedtime routine, I always encourage people start really, really early. Do not start this when you're losing your poop at four months and saying, we have to do something. Like we talk about setting the stage for healthy sleep at birth and simple things like the blackout shades, the white noise. And then like, I have a whole thing about where your twins should sleep. And that's like literally like a two hour discussion right there about how to do this. But planning and having an actionable, realistic plan is how this becomes successful. And the the ritual of it isn't for the benefit of the babies. It's actually for the benefit of the parents. And the sooner that you start that ritual is the sooner that you'll realize where the holes are, the sooner we could patch them and the more success that we're going to have as quick as possible. So for us, where we win over singleton families is we know that we need a plan. There is no, let's have bath time. There is none of that. There is maybe we should have bath time. Okay. Let me check to see if we could do this. That is how it goes because, you know, there's that whole other baby in the mix that makes it challenging for us. Now that's really helpful. I mean, as I listen to this, I'm like, I could have handled two. I'm so regimented. Um, like, as you say, the five to seven, I just, my kids are now five and eight and I just got rid of my kind of mother's helper from five to seven. And she actually just graduated as a speech pathologist from college. Yeah, what are the odds? She, she was awesome. Um, we miss her. Um, but <laughs> so, right, and my kids even, because we've been doing this for years, they know, like, if we don't do bath or shower for some reason, they're like, what? Mm. Huh? Mm, yes. Ah, ah. Like, we've been doing this from day one, so regimented. Uh, what about the idea of getting out the door with two? Because I would struggle just to get out the door with one. And now you have two. Someone has a blowout. Someone's already in there, uh, you know, in the stroller and they're getting hot. Like, it just seems like it's, it will be mayhem. It is. <laughs> uh, my favorite mayhem story is I had to go renew my driver's license Ugh. and <laughs> without, without full-time help. So I did not have any help, but family and I did it. So I'm living proof. I had them vaginally. I had no help. I'm still somewhat functional as a member of society. But that is, you know, I don't know. You, everybody has to be the judge of that. But I remember going to the DMV and then having a full-on blowout in the DMV with my son. And uh, the close, I didn't have enough supplies because my plan was just to go there and come back and not be like there for a day. And I remember having to use napkins from Wendy's as a makeshift diaper for my son. (laughs) And then the liner for, um, you know, the liner that comes in your diaper bag. I had to fashion that into an old school diaper with (laughs) Wendy's napkins as an insert. So, you know what? The moral of that story is. You're MacGyver. (laughs) There's nothing you can't handle. And I would have never said that I'm a MacGyver type of person, but yet for me, I was like, okay, what do I have? Here's what I could do. And then, you know, while I'm not making a bomb with cat hair and gum, I can easily make anything. I'm also really good at coming up with games while dining out. Like that is, I, if I have to have a second, second superpower, that is another one that I'm good at. But Going out with two, it's another issue of preparing. And I love telling people to have two diaper bags, one that is actually ready to go and one that you just came home with. And then, you know, you decide to go out and you forgot to throw all the crap in your bag. So you take that same bag that doesn't have all the supplies and you leave. So for us, you could have kind of this rotating one. And then, of course, we talk about the expense of how to really watch your expenses. And having twins is not twice as expensive. It's actually about one and a half times as expensive. But we do have to buy like two cribs where you have the benefit of using a lot of the same equipment Mm -hmm. for both children. We unfortunately kind of get that baptism by fire of expense expenses and having to just buy all this crap in the beginning. But going out with two, the biggest tip going back to strollers is really do your homework on what type of stroller is going to be best for you. And we talk about that in class because instead of saying, this is the stroller to buy, we talk about side by side versus tandem versus inline. What are the benefits of each? How do we know it's a real twin stroller? Because a lot of companies are selling you a freaking one plus one stroller. It's not a twin stroller. If the seats don't hold the same weight, it is not a twin stroller. And mm-hmm. it infuriates me that people are spending all of this money only 
to not have it go the distance. And then, you know, in the last year that you may be buy, that may you may be using a stroller, you then have to go buy a whole new stroller because it can't accommodate one of your 20s. So we talk about the benefits of each. We talk about the negatives of each. And then we talk about, you know, some of the brands that might work best in an urban environment. But we in New York City, my students aren't only from New York City. I get a lot of students from Connecticut and from the island of Long. Like people come in from everywhere to come to class because this is like the hot ticket in town. So when people come, I don't want to talk to my, you know, downtown New Yorker that, you know, is going to be on cobblestone every day. I need to take into consideration grandma's going to be throwing this in the trunk in Connecticut. So I really try to make like very purposeful recommendations. And for many, many years, I've been working with the Juvenile Products Manufacturers Association. And so I'm their twin person. So a lot of times when things are coming to market, I'll get to see them. So in class, I could say, hey, listen, hold out to January because there's something coming out. Wait, like don't don't buy what's there now. So, Do you have any sort of handout online or or blog or anything I can link to that you kind of break down the different strollers? Because honestly, I just I hadn't thought like I see a lot of the um the one in front of the other of the snap yes. and goes, and then I see the I think it's like a is it called city city stroller where it's the two that kind of fold pretty easily. Um, I hadn't thought too too much about, and then the other ones like the the high and low are those like the yes, jack and that's something. That's the inline. That's the inline. Yeah, we actually have a ton on YouTube. Okay. And we also, I'm trying to think of one in particular. I believe we have like a stroller roundup, so we can link to that too. All right, cool. I'm taking, as I mentioned, yes, I'm taking well, notes. <laughs> we'll definitely do this. But I know that we're constantly on the lookout for any new strollers. And I really, really try to keep my opinions to myself, so to speak, and speak on a factual level instead of a personal one. Unless I see something that's either dangerous, negligent or something, I kind of just like, here's the great things about it. Mm -hmm. But even in the reviews, the funny part is, is that many times companies will get super pissed at me because I'll be like, and here's what kind of sucks. And that's just what it is. It's actually twiniversity.com double dash stroller dash reviews. Great. And it's kind of the compilation of all of our information. But we try to make it really neat and concise and we don't want to confuse people. But one of the, the issues of going out is that, you know, your family buys you this stroller before the babies are even born. And then you're using it in practical reality. And you're like, holy crap. I never thought about this. It's not working up my front three steps. Mm -hmm. So with us, like, I think that that's kind of where P twin parents fail is because they try to keep taking one for the team and being like, well, my family bought this for me where people don't realize it's so simple to resell a double stroller. And the sooner you realize it doesn't work for you, the higher you'll get to that resale value or that retail value and get kind of close to that. And then you call me and then I'm like, okay, that didn't work. Why? Let's go through ones that might work for you. So that, yeah, that's, this that's is not fantastic. Weird. And I'll make sure that we have that link in our show notes. Sure. All right. Now, again, thinking about this super scheduled breastfeeding schedule, uh, getting out the door, lots of time, uh, getting them down, bedtime nap, all that stuff scheduled. How does a parent with twins get some time for themselves? It seems like the schedule is unrelenting. How did you do it? <laughs> you, once again, just do it. But it does have to be scheduled. So the best times to grab time for yourself, this is going to sound so dumb, and I don't think you or your listeners are going to judge me, but if you have a bathtub and you could take a shower, get a clear shower curtain liner and bring the babies in, the, um, you know, even their little bouncy seats, strap them in nice oh, and safely. I did that. All okay, the time. Good. Yeah, I, I would bring the bouncy seat. Sometimes. No, I did the bouncy seat in my shower all the time with my, with my first. Um, it was how I got Oh, a I shower. would say not in the shower with you. We don't no, have I mean, enough not, room, sorry, but not outside. Not in the shower. Outside, okay. like in the, sorry, I meant in the bathroom. Yeah, In the bathroom. Yeah, And I, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean in the shower, like in the bathroom, especially in my shower. My old bathroom, very small, wouldn't have had a very small shower <laughs> in the bathroom. And it was the only time I could figure out how to get a shower in. Yeah. <laughs> it's as crazy as that sounds. He was right there. I was there. And I'm like, you're doing great. 
mom is going to wash her hair now. We're all good. That's Sometimes I have to like wave and be like, ah, yeah, we're still okay. It's like you're putting on some weird kind of shower show. It gets a little weird, but you're like, whatever, I'm doing it. I'm shaking look at my, my Look at me. Wa- exactly. Look yes. at me. Wash my hair. Stay quiet. Got to rinse it out. Like it became, <laughs> right. It became a shower show, but yeah. I got a shower. So I'm so, yeah, no judgment because I did it. <laughs> good. good. Even yeah. now I still rarely get a shower by myself that someone walking in and asking a question. <laughs> Yes. Except now I, I it think my, need to my be a twins show. stopped when they were about ten. Thank God. <laughs> I was like, please, I can't, I can't do this anymore. So that is definitely, you know, a way if you're flying solo with your twenties. Another way is I know that technically they're with you, but you got to get out of the house every single day. And I know it sounds like a lot of work, but everybody needs that fresh air. Everybody needs that vitamin D. And if they fall asleep in the stroller, I'm totally cool with it. Just have a moment of peace by yourself an ice cream, sit under a tree and just soak it in. I promise you they will not need bonus therapy when they get older because you took 15 minutes to have, you know, a chai tea under an oak tree in Washington Square Park. Like don't think about later. You need to preserve yourself now. So it's such a big deal. And Deborah, I am sure that you talk about this a lot in class because hello, these people are coming to you to have a moment of peace and connection and meditation and self-reflection. If you don't do that, your kids will not learn how to do that. Yeah. And if you go, We're modeling go, go, for go, them. go, go, totally. And that's, and I say, and feel free to steal this. You are not relaxing. You are recovering. 100%. And you need to remember that. So when people are like, how am I going to find time to do this? You don't have time to you to not do this for yourself. Because if your leg was broken, my dog is chiming and she's very excited about this. <laughs> but if you don't do this for yourself, then like if your leg was broken and you didn't do it for yourself, you're going to cause yourself a further injury. If you don't take a moment to recover emotionally, you're going to damage yourself Oh, let's, yeah, I 100% agree. I say that to my students all the time, that if you don't take care of yourself, you have nothing left for those that you do need to take care of. 100%. Tell your dog I said hi. I have no problem. Dogs are great. My, okay, my good. cat often walks across this. So we're going to take a super quick break. And when I come back, we're going. I'm going to ask you, you've given so much, but if you have one tip or piece of advice you'd like to offer that we haven't covered, new expectant parents, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. With Lucky Land slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. So we're back. Have you thought about what that one tip or piece of advice you'd like to offer new parents or expectant? 100% I know what I want to tell them. It's something that you, I'm hoping that you um, thought about, but... When we end to university class, it's kind of like my ritual. It's the, one of the, it's the last thing I leave. And as any educator will tell you, the most important little bit of information is always your last. What's your takeaway? What's my takeaway going to be of this? And my takeaway is not about breastfeeding. It is not about delivery. It is not about the stroller or the crib that you're going to buy. My takeaway is about the relationship that you have with your partner. At the end of the day, I promise you, When your kids are looking back on their childhood, they will not remember an eighth of what you think they're going to remember. And the things that you remember, and I I say to my students, how many of you remembered what stroller you were in? For show of hands. Can anybody tell me what kind of stroller you had? But how many of you could remember when there was a really big fight around the holidays with your parents? And how many of you could remember, you know, one of your parents storming out in a rage? Like... And the funny part is, is that I ask a lot of them, well, what happened? Like, did they come back? They don't remember the part of making up and coming back. They remember that rage. Mm -hmm. Their eyes are always on you. 
That's fantastic advice. I love that. We have a podcast called Childproofing Your Marriage. I'm going to link to that as well. I think this is such important. You need the foundation. Otherwise, it's just, you know, built on sand. So you've done incredible work. Where can people find your work? You could find me everywhere at Twiniversity. So it's, it's not Twin University. New York State would not let me call myself that. So we're Twiniversity, and we're on literally every social platform. We are just Twiniversity.com. Um, we have our Twiniversity podcast as well, which is exclusively, I'm sorry, singletons, but it's exclusively uh, twin parenting topics. But there's, there's nothing that we don't cover. We are a no holds barred, rip off the band aid, show us your soul. Twiniversity, we are not an aesthetic Instagram page. We are not Instagram ready. Like, we are raw and ready. And if that makes you uncomfortable, I'm sorry, but I'd rather you see what's behind the curtain and help you through it than pretend that there's some fantasy land going on. Can it be fantasy? Hell yeah. Like there's definitely moments of fantasy. I, they're definitely there. But in reality, our job is to make sure that you feel connected, educated, and that we're going to literally laugh the whole time. That is what Twiniversity is all about. And we will have, again, all those links. It has been such a pleasure and fun um, <laughs> talking to you today. Thank you so much for your time. It is my pleasure entirely. Thanks for having me. Of course. Enjoy your day. Bye. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.